And now, as we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us first turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, may your Holy Spirit descend upon us, rest among us and within us. May your Spirit quiet in us all of the worries and anxieties, the distractions from being fully present to your word today. We pray that your Spirit will open our minds, our ears, our hearts to hear these words that in hearing them, we might believe them, and that in believing them, we might go forth from this place into the world to live more faithfully as disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. We have been, for the last several weeks, going through the letter to the Ephesians and have been preaching a sermon series, the overall title of which has been No Longer Strangers, we started in the middle of those lectionary readings, so the last week and this week we've jumped back to the beginning of the book of Ephesians. And our lesson today, which is the last lesson in this series, comes from chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And it is in this particular passage that we hear this phrase that captured our imagination and called us to have this sermon series called No Longer Strangers. Listen now for the word of God. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Anne Lamott is a writer about the life of faith and a reluctant public speaker who happens to draw big, big crowds. Her latest book, Dusk, Night, Dawn, on Revival and Courage, came out this year during this season of pandemic. The book contains reflections on faith and pandemic, as well as a number of her reflections on what it has been like to get married for the first time in her mid-60s. In the prologue to her book, she tells the story of leaving pre-pandemic for a speaking engagement very soon after getting married and immediately on the heels of the first real fight of their short married life. Throughout the trip, her first speaking engagement since getting married, everyone everywhere asked her the same question in a cheery tone. So, how's married life? She writes, what is the correct answer? Especially when you have been together for almost two years and are not, at that very moment, convinced it was a necessary change. As the new husband is a know-it-all and does not obey your will and sneezes too loudly like a howler monkey with allergies. <laughs> Great, I kept answering to make the questioners happy. 
Is it supposed to be this ordinary, where you're still mostly madly in love and you've never met someone so brilliant who is also kind 95% of the time, but who is as set in his annoying ways as you are in yours? When she arrives at the speaking engagement and enters the room full of 1,000 women who have bought tickets to hear her speak, she asks the moderator what the first question of the night will be, and the moderator says enthusiastically, how's married life? <laughs> Anne writes, I loved the faces of the women under the tent that night, the whole gamut in age, looks, fashion, and I wanted to tell them the exact right thing. I am always hoping that at church or in spiritual meetings, someone will say the exact right thing that will save me from my bad mind and worries that day. I asked myself what that might be. A pastor friend once told me of her grandfather, who had also been a minister. When she was young, a friend asked her what he did. She replied, Every Sunday, he stands in front of everyone and tells them that they are beautiful and God loves them exactly the way they are and they really don't have to worry because they all have each other. But then by Tuesday, they forget this. So the next Sunday, he goes back to the church and tells them that they are beautiful and God loves them just the way they are and they don't have to worry because they all have each other no matter what. She concludes by saying, I do not always know the exact right thing, but at 66, I continue to believe that love is sovereign here. The soul of genius, Mozart reputedly said, is love, 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 God's love, our love, the love of Christ for us, the love we have for one another through Christ. It is true of the sometimes difficult relationship of marriage. It is true in our families, with our friends. It is true in our relationship with God and with each other in the church. I think this main idea may not be so far off from what the writer to the letter of the Ephesians is trying to tell that congregation. He wants the Jewish and Gentile Christians in that congregation to know that even though they have believed all their lives that they were impossibly divided from each other as Jews and Gentiles, even though hostility existed between them as long as recorded history, that is no longer their reality. Paul wants them to know that Jewish and Gentile Christians alike are called to believe to the very core of their beings that they are equally loved by God, just the way they are. And he wants them to remember that no matter what else may happen in this world, as adopted children of God and as citizens together of God's kingdom, they are no longer divided. Now they are one new people in Jesus Christ. They are called to exhibit something radically new and different to a world that knows so much hostility and division. Paul was calling them to end all of the divisions between them, all the hostilities, all prejudice and fear, and to be at peace with one another. Now, he was not naive enough to believe that they could make peace with one another on their own. Their divisions and hostilities were centuries old and they ran very deep. But he wanted them to understand that they did not have to make peace with each other on their own. Paul told them that Jesus Christ was their peace. Jesus Christ is the bridge that will span any and every dividing wall they try to erect between themselves. Instead of building walls between them, Jesus is tearing down all of those walls of division, and now Jesus is building a new temple out of them. Each one of them would be a brick in that temple. Jesus himself will be the cornerstone that will hold the whole structure together, and all of them, with Jesus as their peace, will become a fit dwelling place for God. Eugene Peterson puts it this way in his translation of this passage in the message. 
Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of hostility. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name of Christian as anyone. Of course, the reality is different from this biblical ideal much of the time, if we are honest. And the reality is that it is so hard, isn't it, putting an end to the divisions between us. We know in our souls that we are called to be a community of love, faith, grace, reconciliation, justice, and hope. We know that we are called to live together in unity. That has been so clear throughout the letter to the Ephesians. This letter is full of the great good news of the abundant, lavish, remarkable gifts of grace, mercy, and love God pours out upon us in Jesus Christ. This book tells us that all of those gifts come to us as a free gift of God's grace. We did not earn our place in God's love. God simply loved us, even when we did not deserve it. God moved toward us to save us in Jesus Christ. And then God called us to live out our faith in Jesus within a community of other Christians. For us this morning, that means that we are called to live out our faith in Jesus within this community that is Independent Presbyterian Church. But sometimes we forget how to live our faith out with each other in a daily practice of loving each other, forgiving each other, trusting each other, taking hold of each other's hands and working together to share the good news of Jesus Christ with each other and with the hurting world. Sometimes we forget how to love each other and how to allow Christ to be our peace. Paul told the Ephesians that there were no more dividing walls of hostility between them. Because in his death on the cross, with his arms spread wide to include the whole world, Christ had torn down every wall. Christ had put an end to every worldly hostility and division. We know from Paul's letters that the earliest Christians continued to struggle with this new reality as they battled each other over cultural, political, social, religious, and theological differences. And we know well that Christian history is littered with division, as we have splintered the body of Christ time and time again over the centuries. And here at IPC, as well as in other individual churches, at various times in our own history, there have been moments when dividing walls of hostility have been erected between our own beloved members over theological differences, cultural and social and political differences. It is a part of the human condition that we erect dividing walls to keep out those who are different from us in some way. It is an ingrained part of our American life now, it seems. More and more these days, we live in our own echo chambers, cut off from one another by any number of issues, allowing dividing walls of hostility between us to grow taller and thicker and to become harder to penetrate or to tear down. We can and do foster an environment in our nation and even in our churches at times where we become strangers to one another. Paul told the Ephesians that they were no longer strangers in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is our peace. He alone is our peace. He calls us to allow him to make peace between us and to remember that we need each other in order to live most faithfully as disciples of Jesus Christ. He wants us to remember that no difference between us is as powerful as Christ's reconciling love at work among us. He is our peace. Jesus alone is our peace. 
We cannot make peace with each other on our own, but with Christ and the Holy Spirit at work within us and among us, nothing is impossible. If we start from the place where we recognize that every single one of us loves Jesus and that each one of us is trying to our best to serve him, and if we start from the place where we recognize that Jesus loves each one of us in equal measure, that he died for each one of us, all of our differences pale in comparison to those deep truths. In the last year and a half of this pandemic, if it has reminded us of anything, it is this fundamental truth. We need each other. We need each other here in this place, in the flesh, not just on a screen, but physically present. We need each other in all of our beautiful variety, working every day on living more faithfully as disciples of Jesus Christ, individually and as a church. We need each other's thoughts, each other's understandings of scripture and theology, each other's gifts and talents and energies and passions. We need each other's care and compassion and strength when times are hard. And we need each other's laughter and joy and celebration when times are good. We need each other's prayers and words of comfort and hope. We need each other's admonishment when we stray from the path of Christ. We need each other's grace when we seek forgiveness, and we need to offer forgiveness when others seek it from us. We need each other's voices lifted in worship beside us in the pews. We need to be able to see each other's faces. One day, God willing, without a mask, so that we can see the face of God in each other for we come to know God better when we see God in each other. We need to know each other's stories, to share each other's lives. We need to learn to love Jesus and to be loved by him together in this place. We need to believe to the very core of our being that we are no longer strangers because we have been made one family in Jesus Christ, one family in all of its glorious, hard, beautiful, and messy reality. And we need each other as companions on the journey as we go outside of these walls to share the love of Christ with the world that desperately needs to believe that they are no longer strangers. They are no longer divided, but beloved children of God, redeemed by our Lord Jesus Christ, for abundant life. One of my favorite poets is a woman named Naomi Shihab Nye. She is of Palestinian descent. One of her writings is called Gate A4, and it has always seemed to me to be about the sacrament of communion, in which we are brought near to one another in spite of our differences and reminded that we are no longer strangers. She writes, Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal, after learning my flight had been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing. Help, said the flight attendant. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly in Arabic. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, we're fine. You'll get there just later. Who is picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother until we got on the plane and that I would ride night right next to her. She talked with him. Then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. 
Then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found, of course, that they had 10 shared friends. Then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling of her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamoul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag, and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free apple juice from huge coolers, and two little girls from our flight ran around serving it, and they were covered with powdered sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, we were now holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves, such an old country tradition. Always carry a plant. Always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around the gate of late and weary ones, and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying and confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all the other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. As we approach the table of the Lord's Supper this morning, I hope you will take a moment to look around you at your fellow travelers along the journey of faith. Some may look bright and happy today. Others may look weary or worried or grieving. But we are here together. And the sacrament is spread out before us, a little bread, a little juice, a feast of unimaginable love and grace. Christ is the host of the table, inviting you to come and to share a true communion with one another, remembering that he and he alone is our peace. He is the bridge over any and all dividing walls we try to erect between us. Remember as you come that you are beautiful and God loves you just the way you are. And no matter what may come in this world, you do not have to be afraid because you have each other and you have Jesus. You are no longer strangers. You have been given this family to share your journey. And together with Christ, we are building a dwelling place for God who promises to be with us always. We are no longer strangers. We belong to Christ. We belong to each other, come what may. And that is no small thing. It is more than enough. It is everything. In the name of our Father, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.